Okay, uh, thank you. Thanks to the organizers for putting this event together. Um, so I'm sorry, I have a cold, so you're going to hear some breathing on the microphone. It may sound a little bit strange. Um, <clears throat> so my title uh, mentioned self-similar measures, but in fact, most of the talk I'll talk about self-similar sets. Um, hopefully that'll make it more transparent. And uh, in a conference about hyper hyperbolicity and dimension, uh, this talk really is on the dimension side. There is almost no hyperbolicity, but it's about a very sort of basic object in, in fractal geometry, so hopefully um, it'll interest also the, the dynamicists here. Um, so I, what I want to tell you about is, is the problem of computing the dimension of a self-similar set. Um, it's, very, it's a very uh, classical problem. Very, it looks elementary. It's not so elementary. And what I want to do is explain the problem and, and the conjectures about, about this problem and tell you about some progress. And I'll briefly mention some applications. I won't, I won't dwell on them too much. And hopefully I'll have time to explain a little bit about the idea of the proof. One of the main ingredients in the proof is um, to use ideas from additive combinatorics. And so I'll, I'll try to, to devote some time to that. And then if there's any time at the end, I'll talk about the, the higher dimensional case. But the first part of the talk is going to be just on the line. So self-similar sets on the line. <clears throat> and the, uh, so the object that you look at is you have, you have a system of, con of uh, linear or affine contractions, but affine on the real line means just similarities, right? Um, so you have a collection fi, i in some finite set lambda. So lambda is just a set of indices. Um, and the fi's are uh, as, as I said, affine maps, and I'm going to assume that they all contract by the same amount, so they contract by some number r, and each one multiplies x by r and then translates by some number. So r is a fixed number between 0 and 1. Um, this is just an assumption uh, for simplicity. You could allow each of them to contract by different amounts. I, I won't. Maybe at the end I'll mention what you do then. Uh, but this is the setting, and then there <coughs> it's a very basic fact. It's a theorem by Hutchison, although it probably goes back may, um, in this setting, in the linear setting, maybe further, that there exists a unique, um, compact, non-empty set X, which is the union of its images under the maps Fi. And X is called a self-similar set. Right? And so let me draw a picture. The picture I'll draw actually is in two dimensions because drawing Drawing uh, things in one dimension somehow is too cramped. So the picture that you all know is that <clears throat> you can imagine if you take a big enough ball in these maps, fi will map the ball into itself. And then, so each of the maps, fi takes this ball and maps it somehow into itself. And then each of these balls get further mapped into themselves. And in, inside each of these, you see a copy of this picture. And, and you iterate it, and you get a Cantor set. Well, maybe. You might get you could get a continuum, continuum also. And uh, this picture is a little bit misleading because this is sort of the textbook case. Um, and we have a formula for the dimension in this case, which I'll mention soon. But the truth is that you could have something messier that looks like this. You could have your um, set, which gets mapped into itself, but the images are not disjoint. And when you iterate, you get further things that intersect. And of course, this picture is, is also misleading because I'm not really inter interested in whether this ball the, whether its images intersect itself. But um, when you go to the limit, the, the point is that this union might not be disjoint. And when the union is not disjoint, it's quite complicated to figure out what the dimension is. So the problem I want to talk about is precisely this. What is the dimension of x? And there's a <coughs> uh, maybe a, a, a remark. It's sort of amusing. I, I've, there have been five or six talks, no, maybe eight talks already in this conference. And I think very few people have chosen the same notation for Hausdorff dimension. Each talk has a different notation. Um, so, but, so the remark is that, and, and also different notations for Minkowski dimension, the remark, and this is, this is I think, due to Falconer, is that uh, in this case, Hausdorff and Minkowski dimension are the same. So I'm just going to write dim. So the dimension here is the Hausdorff dimension, but if you prefer, you can think of the Minkowski dimension. For these nice sets, there's no difference. In general, of course, you can have 
different values. <coughs> um, so what is a dimension? Well, uh, there's some trivial things you can say. So the first trivial bound, well, x is a subset of the line, so its dimension is at most 1. Um, that's completely trivial. Now, the second uh, trivial bound is based on the fact that you can iterate this, uh, def this defining relation, and you get a, an efficient cover. Or maybe it's efficient. You get some kind of cover of, of, the, of the attractor. Um, by sets, and you can count them, and you can you know what their uh, diameters are going to be. So, um, if you iterate uh, that relation up there, you see that for every n, you can write x as the union over sequences of length n in the indices of f i one composed with f i two, and so on up to f i n of x. This composition I'm going to usually denote f sub sequence i. Okay, and <clears throat> what happens here is that this is a union. You have lambda, magnitude of lambda to the n uh, terms or uh, elements, and these guys. Well, all my maps contract by r, so the diameter is going to be r to the n times the diameter of x. And so now, if you just uh, getting the bound from Minkowski dimension, you immediately get that the dimension of x is bounded by, um, and you, of course, you can do this for any n, and, and these things, their diameter is going to 0. So when you, you plug it into the formula from Minkowski dimension, you get that this is the dimension is at most log of the number of maps over log 1 over r. <coughs> so these are the two trivial bounds. And so let's denote by delta of x the smaller of these two numbers. Uh, sorry, log minimum of 1 in the log of the number of maps over log of 1 over r. And then what we've just seen is that the dimension is bounded by this delta. So this is not standard notation, but it's, it's convenient. OK, so we have an upper bound. And the question I, I really want to talk about today is, when, when is there equality? OK, so there are classical cases that tell you um, you have equality if um, x is a disjoint union of its images, or if you have the open set condition. And then you can, <clears throat> I mean, if you make enough assumptions, I and mean, if you somehow control, if the union is not disjoint, but you, cut, you, you control how many overlaps happen at each scale, then you can, you can say something. But um, so there's some maybe weakenings of open set condition and some combinatorial assumptions you can make, but, but this is pretty much what's known. Which, and OK, so, and, uh, so why is this question interesting? Well, it's a little bit humiliating that we can't compute the dimension of this thing. This is the simplest kind of fractal set that you have. So you really should be able, you really should be able to compute this. <coughs> OK, so that's, so that's the answer, uh, a partial answer to when you have equality. When do you have an inequality? Well, there is one, again, there's a combinatorial assumption you can make, which will, in some cases, give you such an inequality. Um, so we say, that, um, we say that exact overlaps occur. If there exists some n, and there exist two sequences, i and j, of length n in our, uh, in our symbols, this different sequences, such that the maps fi and fj agree. Um, what this means in this picture is that there is some, if you go, if you iterate this a few times, you get to a point where you have two, I mean, here you have two little things that intersect, but you could have two things that exactly agree. 
And if that happens, then you say there are exact overlaps. There, there's an equivalent way of saying this. Exact overlaps means that the set of maps fi is not a free generating set. for the semigroup f sequence i over all finite sequences of indices. Which this is a sem sub semigroup of the affine map of the line. So exact overlaps is really an algebraic. Well, this is a combinatorial condition. This is an algebraic condition. They're the same thing. And when or if, if delta of x is less than 1, or less than or equal than 1, well, if it's less than 1, then exact overlaps um, imply that the dimension of x is strictly less than delta of x. And the reason is that, <clears throat> well, let's, let's see why that is. Because, um, well, if suppose that you have these i and j in lambda n, so that f i is equal to fj, then you can just take, you can iterate, you can, well, this, this relationship over here, x being the union over all sequences of length n of f sub i of x, <coughs> exactly is a presentation of x as a self-similar similar set for these maps. So you could look at gamma to be lambda to the n minus this i. Um, and then, x is the union over, say, u and gamma of f u of x. But here you have lambda to the n minus 1 map uh, uh, sets. And, and each f u contracts by um, r to the n. And then you get that the dimension. So then just from the trivial bound, you get that the dimension of x is bounded by um, well, log of the size of gamma over log of 1 over r to the n. And this is, this is lambda to the n minus 1. So this is strictly less than log of the size of lambda over log 1 over r, which in this case is delta of x. Because <coughs> if delta x is less than 1, then that means that its value is precisely this. So this is, this is again, very elementary. So there's, this, so there's this algebraic obstruction that can cause the dimension to be too small. And so the conjecture um, which I want to talk about is that, in fact, this is the only way that the dimension can be too small. So the conjecture is that if the dimension of x is less than delta x, then <coughs> um, there exist exact overlaps. So this conjecture, um, in this strong form, uh, you, is it, I've seen it attributed to Karoli Shimon in a survey paper by Yuval Peres and, uh, and Boris Solomiak, I think, um, from the early 90s. Uh, but there are some special cases of it, which I'll discuss later, which are very, um, very classical. And Yes, yes, that, that's a good point. I know it's not the best notation, but delta x depends on the maps. Yeah. It depends on the maps and on the presentation. Um, okay, so as I said, this uh, conjecture, there is an algebraic flavor to it <coughs> because it says that the only obstruction to having the largest possible dimension that you you think you should have, and and this 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 quantity is again it's, it's purely combinatorial, and it basically comes about by ignoring the overlaps by pretending that nothing overlaps. Um, it says the only obstruction to that is algebraic. Um, let me state um, now, before I go on to what we know, let me state the analogous thing for measures. So self-similar measures. Well, so now we have the same, um, we have the same family of contractions. And now we also have a probability vector indexed by la lambda. And so then there exists a unique Borel prob probability measure 
which satisfies that mu is the sum over i in lambda of p i, um, so this is scalar times the push forward of <coughs> mu by f i. So this is mu composed with f i inverse. <coughs> and then there is an analogous uh, trivial upper bound on the dimension of mu. So again, this depends on the presentation, but so delta mu is going to be the entropy of the vector p over minus, well, over, in this case, log 1 over r. This is the Lyapunov exponent, if you want to think about it that way. And this is the entry. This is the usual formula for dimension um, that you get in a, in, in a smooth system. Um, and then <clears throat> you could ask the same thing. You can ask when is the dimension of mu less than the minimum, less than this delta. Oh, sorry. No, 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 no. Sorry. Uh, hold on. Delta mu is going to be the, sorry, the minimum of 1 and this quantity. And th you, then you can ask, when is the dimension of mu going to be strictly less, or when is it going to be equal to delta mu, where the dimension, well, there's a fact. You, again, you have to specify what kind of dimension you mean for the measure. It's a fact here, again, that uh, these measures are exact dimensional. So they're, you don't really have to worry too much about what kind of dimension you mean. So let me just take the lower Hausdorff dimension. So it's the infimum if of the dimension of A, such that the measure gives A positive mass. But as I said, if you take the upper Hausdorff dimension or some other notion, it usually works out okay. Works out to the same thing. Okay. So what do we know? So what? So the main theorem is that. Well, we, I don't know if the conjecture is true, but that you can state a weaker version of it which says that if the dimension of x is less than delta x, or if the dimension of mu is, is less than delta mu, then <coughs> some of these uh, small scale copies are going to be very close. They may not exactly coincide. You may not have exact overlaps, but you'll have almost exact overlaps. Um, and so what I need to do now is quantify what it means for two of these small sets to be very close together. Um, so um, let's define delta of n to be, well, there's different ways you can do this. Um, I'm just going to fix a point in, in the attractor. And then in each of these small copies, there's an analogous point. I'm just going to take the, di the smallest distance between them. So it's the minimum, delta n is the minimum of fi of 0 minus fj of 0, where i and j range over all sequences, all distinct sequences of length n. So I think now I will go to a one-dimensional picture. So if this was your attractor, it contains all these small-scale copies of itself. And you can assume for free, I mean, I chose 0 here for a completely arbitrary reason. You can always translate, you can always change the coordinates so that 0 is in the set. So let's just assume that 0 is the left end point. Makes things easy. Then fi of 0, in the definition of delta n is all of these points, and you're taking the two that are closest together. And so then, if you, <coughs> if you make this definition, it's very clear, first of all, that there exists an n such that delta n is equal to 0 if and only if you have exact overlaps. Because saying, well, so here I am using, in this statement, I am using the fact that they all contract by the same amount. Because if you have two affine maps that contract by the same amount, and they map some, and they map 0 to the same point, then they're the same map. So this is special to the line, and this is special to the fact that the contraction is uniform. So, but uh, OK. But this is, this is clear. Um, another thing that's clear is that delta n goes to 0 exponentially. In fact, it's, it's, it's easy to see that there exists some constant c, which is, I think, maybe the diameter of the set x, such that delta n is at most c times r to the n. 
R is, R is the contraction. Um, so this is just the pigeonhole principle because all of the, assuming that zero is in the set, all of these points fi of zero are in the set. Um, no, actually, probably this isn't R. I, I take that back. There's some, there's some, there's some positive C. Um, okay, C between zero and one, so that this is less than C to the n. So just so there's exponentially many points for each n. There's exponentially many points in this set of diameter x. Um, and uh, okay, so two of them are going to be exponentially close together. And the third remark is that in some cases. Um, there exists a lower bound. There's some positive C such that delta n is bigger than C to the n, e.g., if you have the open set condition. This is true. So, um, so really, in general, all you know is that delta n is going to 0 exponentially. If it hits 0, then you have exact overlaps, but it might not hit 0. In fact, it might, it might decay only exponentially. And so the... the the main theorem here is that if the dimension of x is strictly less than delta x, then delta n goes to 0 super exponentially. Right, so the conjecture, the conjecture is that in this case it should hit 0. We don't know that, but we know that it's going to 0 faster than the naive estimate gives you. <clears throat> what this means is that for every constant c, c to the n delta n, goes to 0. And also, if mu is self-similar, and if the dimension of mu is strictly less than delta of mu, then the same thing is true. Delta n goes to 0 super exponentially. And this is an interesting statement, actually, because you'll note that the con this condition, that delta n goes to 0 super exponentially, does not involve the probability vector that defined the self-similar measure. So it says that if, so here's how you, <clears throat> let me state this in the, in the contrapositive. If there exists a positive c such that delta n is bigger than c to the n, then for all self-similar measures, the dimension of mu is equal to delta mu. So it doesn't, so it doesn't depend somehow on the probabilities that you choose. And of course, also, the, same, the dimension of x is equal to delta of x. OK, so I want to, um, <clears throat> so that's the theorem. I want to quickly tell you about some applications and then say a little bit about the proof. <clears throat> okay, so first let me, um, let me give you a, a corollary that says that the conjecture is true in the algebraic world. So if the parameters that defined the contraction. So I just erased that blackboard. But ai, so remember that fi of x was rx plus ai. Um, if these guys are algebraic, then um, the conjecture is true, meaning that either the dimension is delta of x or there are exact overlaps. And the reason this is true <clears throat> is the following. Well, first let's compute what is f sub i of 0. f sub i of 0 is, well, you, you, do, you compute it. And uh, I mean, this, this is a composition of affine maps. And what you get is that it's the sum k from 1 to n of a k r to the k minus 1. Uh, yeah, I think that's what it is. And so this is a polynomial. In these variables, there are several variables. But it's a polynomial, an integer coefficient polynomial. The coefficients are all 1 in these algebraic numbers. And there's a lemma 
which says that if alpha 1 up to alpha m are algebraic, then um, for every polynomial g with integer coefficients in m variables, either, sorry, um, let me say that again. For every m algebraic numbers, there exists a constant. <coughs> say a positive constant, such that for any polynomial in m variables, either g of alpha 1, alpha m is 0, or the absolute value of g of alpha 1 up to alpha m is at least c to the degree of the polynomial g. So th th this is not, not hard. Let me prove it to you quickly when the, uh, when the parameters are, are rational numbers. If they're rational numbers, then you just look at g of this thing, and you see that if it's not 0, then it's a rational number whose denominator is, the, is bounded by the maximal denominator of these guys to the power of the degree. And then, OK, it's either 0 or it's bounded by the denominator to the power of the degree, which you can express, in, well, this constant. So we'll depend on, 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 those, on the denominators of the original alpha i. OK, so, I, so this, is, this is an exercise in, in elementary field theory. Um, maybe not an easy exercise, but not too hard. Um, and uh, what it tells you <coughs> is that exactly the contrapositive uh, that I stated over there as a corollary is, is satisfied in this case. So now, now, it fo now the, now the um, corollary follows from the other corollary. So if you're a number theorist, then this tells you that the conjecture is true unconditionally because all numbers are algebraic numbers. Um, if you're an analyst, this is not yet satisfying, but it's something. Um, <coughs> OK. Um, what, ab what happens when the parameters are not, when the coefficients are not algebraic? Well, th let me give you an example. This is an example that has received some attention. It's a, it's a question by Furstenberg about a very concrete set, so the one-dimensional Sierpinski gasket. So what you do is you start with the unit square, and you divide it into nine parts one-third by one-third, and then you choose these three. And then you continue to partition it. <coughs> ay, ay, ay. That was not good. Um, you continue to partition it, so in th at the second generation, you get this thing. And now what you do is you take a parameter t, and you look at the projection. So pi t is going to be the projection, I don't know, with uh, so the slope of the kernel of pi t is t. It's how you parameterize it exactly is not so important. So you take the linear projection, and you project this fractal set that you get onto the line. Now wh what's the connection with what we've been talking about? Well, this is a self-similar set. And when you project it, you also get a self-similar set. <coughs> and you can see. Uh, I should probably be more careful how I do this. Sorry, let me, if I'm going to write down a formula, I better be more precise. So pi t of xy is going to be tx plus y, or x plus ty. I don't know. It doesn't really matter so much. And then pi t of x, so x is this set in the plane, is the attractor of the maps that take x to 1 third x, x to 1 third x plus 1, and x to 1 third x plus t. That's, again, an easy calculation. And so it's a self-similar set. And the contraction is a rational number, but t in general is not a, a, a rational number. So it's, a, it's some translation. And so it doesn't fit into the scheme of the previous corollary. Now, when are you going to have exact overlaps? Well, that happens when, um, if you. Well, you could, for example, project at 45 degrees, and then these two pieces would exactly map to the same thing. Or you could take any of these two second-generation squares and project in a direction so that they exactly coincide. And if you do that, 
then this system is going to have exact overlaps. And it's pretty easy to see that that's the only way it will have exact overlaps. And that happens exactly when, well, if you want two of these squares to map to the same thing, then your slope is going to be rational. Um, you can also say exactly when, when it happens. So there's going to be some congruence condition, mod 3 on the numerator and denominator, or something like that. So um, what Furstenberg conjectured was that in this, in this case, <coughs> the dimension of the dimension of the uh, projections should be 1. You can compute, again, you can check that you have three maps contracting by 1 third. So delta of, of the images is, uh, is 1. And you conjecture that the dimension is 1 always. I mean, whenever t is irrational. And that's true. So this is, this is the one, essentially the only case where we have non-algebraic parameters where we can say anything. And the, the proof is due to uh, Pablo Schmerkin and Boris Solomiak. So let me state it. So the theorem is that if t is irrational, then the dimension of pi t of x is 1. which is delta of pi t of x. And let me say that um, if you look at rational parameters, then Kenyon classified um, the behavior of uh, pi tx. So actually, you can say for the rational ones, you can say exactly how pi tx behaves. Um, this is a strange example. So the, um, OK, for the hyperbolic dynamics people, this is maybe not the most um, exciting example. But there's one, there's one curious thing here, which is, that, so as I said, this is not a consequence of that corollary about algebraic parameters, because t is not um, algebraic. <clears throat> but it's important in the proof that 1 third is algebraic. So what happens if instead of, con of c the using uh, con uh, contractions of 1 third in the construction, what if you take 1 over pi? or some irrational number, we have no idea. We have no idea what happens if you do the same construction. You know, this is 1 over, one over e. I don't want to say pi, because pi is the projections. 1 over e. Um, and you project what happens. So OK, so we don't know that, it's, that exact overlaps the only culprit. But we can say something. So let me go on to the next application which is to parametric families. So this, um, this type of problem, this projection problem, is a problem about a, a parame parametric family of sets. Pi t of x depends on t. Um, and of course, this type of question is, is really, you can view this theorem as a strengthening of uh, Marstrand's theorem, which tells you that the, this is the right dimension for almost every t. <clears throat> so in the general case, you're going to take um, a i, which depend on t, and r, which depend on t, for t in some, I don't know, interval, say. Um, and then you would like to say, um, let's write e for the set of t's such that the dimension of x sub t, so x, I should say, so x sub t is the attractor. Ah, no, I'm sorry. I should say more than that, right? So f i sub t of x is a i of, is r i, sorry, is r of t x plus a i of t. So then the attractor x also depends on t. And then you can look at the set of parameters where the dimension of the attractor is less than what it should be. And there are many, there's a very developed machinery for showing that this set at least has uh, Lebesgue measure 0 in the interval i using uh, transversality methods. So that goes back to um, Polycott and Shimon, I think. Well, of course, to Marstrand, and then in some more sophisticated cases, Polycott and Shimon, and uh, Paris and Schlag, and many, many, uh, many, many, many improvements. Um, so let me tell you, I think I won't have time to explain it, but let, let me just tell you what, what, what this theorem gives you. It tells you that if, if um, the maps t go to rt and t goes to ait <coughs> are real analytic, which covers basically any case that you want to think about, 
Um, and if you have, there's a non-degeneracy condition. So for any two infinite sequences, i and j in lambda to in, in lambda to the uh, integers distinct for any two such things, um, if you look at f sub i of zero minus f sub j of zero, this is not constantly equal to zero. So what is f sub i of zero? It's the limit of f sub i one up to i n of zero. And the limit exists because this, these things are contractions. So this is, this is a non-degeneracy condition that basically says that you're not taking one iterated function system with, with exact overlaps and just conjugating it by a family of maps. So basically, that's what it says. Um, under these conditions, the Hausdorff dimension of E is zero. So you have very few exceptions. And in fact, also packing dimension of E is zero. Um, it's a little bit stronger. And you, you, the same statement is true if <clears throat> instead of sets you look at self-similar measures. So that brings me to the last application, which I'll mention really quickly and then, well, maybe I won't even mention it. Okay, I'll mention it quickly. Last application is to Bernoulli convolutions. which is the measure. So you have a parameter lambda between 1 half and 1. So I assume that many of you have seen this, so I'm not going to do it too quickly. But you have a parameter lambda between 1 half and 1. And the new lambda is the self-similar me self -similar measure that looks like this. It's 1 half f minus of, of new lambda plus 1 half f plus of new lambda, where f plus minus of x is lambda x plus minus 1. And it's an old problem that goes back to Erdős and Garcia and other people, which asks when is nu lambda absolutely continuous with respect to Lebesgue measure. And the world record is basically Borsolomek's uh, proof that is true for almost every lambda, although there have been slight improvements by Paris and Schlag. And what this, so what the last theorem tells you is that. <clears throat> tells you well what it tells you is that the dimension of new lambda is one except for a zero dimensional set of parameters it also tells you something else not not the parametric theorem but the the the, the, the theorem about algebraic numbers tells you that also in some specific cases you can say that the dimension is one if for example lambda is a rational number and also in some algebraic cases. So you can, it gives you some, <coughs> some information. And so after this, uh, after the preprint appeared, Pablo Schmerkin found a very clever way to improve this um, and he showed that you actually get absolute continuity except a zero-dimensional set of lambda, and the, the reason, and okay, and so this is the state of things. So we, we're down to dimension zero, and we believe it's believed by some people anyway that the set of exceptions is countable, but we're not there yet. The one thing I do want to point out is that this argument does not give you any concrete examples where you have absolute continuity. So there's some ga there's still a difference between this and this, in the sense that here you get you get um, some concrete parameters, and it's really, it would be really interesting if, for example, you could say this for rational lambda. But that's, that's beyond what we can do. Okay, I'm not going to have very much time to talk about additive combinatorics, but let me try to say something. Okay, so. Okay, so I'll try in five or ten minutes to give you some idea of, of what, what goes into the proof. So what is additive combinatorics at a very superficial level? It studies the operation of adding sets. So if you have two sets of numbers, 
you can look at the Minkowski sum of all pairs from each of the sets. And what additive combinatorics tries to do is to <coughs> look at the, as, well, first explain the structure of the set and then deduce from the structure of the set things about the sets A and B. Um, now, if you look at, we had this, this basic relation. If you iterate the defining relation of x n times, we had this, this formula. And if you, um, if you expand, uh, as we did before, uh, what it means to compose these fi, fi's with themselves uh, n times, what this is actually equal to is f sub i of 0 plus r to the n x. And so <clears throat> if you plug that in, what's written here is you're taking all the sums f i of 0 plus r to the n x as i ranges over sequences of length n. And let me write that as x superscript n plus x, where x superscript n is just the set of, is just this set f sub i of 0 as i ranges over sequences of length n. So what is this xn? You can think of it as the nth generation approximation of, of x. So again, if this is x, then you go down a couple of generations. And if, you, if this was 0, then x2 is going to be this set of points. It has nine points in this picture. It's a finite set. Right, so x, n in general, is a set of cardinality lambda to the n. Well, less than or equal to lambda to the n. But assuming that there's no exact overlaps, it's exactly this big. <coughs> now. You can uh, get a similar relation using the same, the same argument. You can look at x of n plus m. Um, how do you get x of n plus n? Well, you go down n steps and you look at these points, and then at each of them there is attached a copy of the original set, and you can look at x m, and that gives you some points in there. And what you get if you, if you, well, if you write out the definition of this is that it looks like this, x of n plus r to the n x of m, where this is just, you just take the mth approximation, scale it down by r to the n. And well, this actually r looks a little bit like a co-cycle relation. I don't, I don't have anything intelligent to say about that, but this does look like a co-cycle relation of some kind. Um, OK, now what, what can we say about, um, about these sets? Well, suppose, so let me make some simplifying assumptions. First of all, suppose that there are no exact overlaps. Suppose that the dimension of x is less than, strictly less than delta x. And suppose that <coughs> the contraction is 1 over p for, for some integer p. So this will just, this will make life a little bit easier. And now, let's look at, so let's see what, we, what the dimension bound gives us. Let's look at the p-adic intervals. So d of n is going to be the partition of the line into intervals of the form k over p to the n, k plus 1 over p to the n. And so then the dimension, well, let's define, sorry, one more thing. Let's define n n of a, of a set A to be the number of, in, of these intervals that you need to cover A, so, or the number of intervals that intersect A. Then what you know is from the fact that, as I said in the beginning, that the Minkowski dimension of x is equal to the Hausdorff dimension, the dimension is just the limit of log nn of x over n log p. <coughs> I 
as n goes to infinity. And it's not hard to see, and I'll, I, won't, I won't go into details, that if you replace x with its nth approximation, that's good enough. Um, so in other words, we know that n, n of the nth approximation is like, my logarithms are in base 2, so it's like 2 to the, this thing, well, log p times dim x plus little o of 1, all of that times n. And this, I should give this a name. So let me say that dim x is equal to delta x minus epsilon. So this is just the magnitude of lambda minus epsilon. Okay. Now, what else do we know? Well, if we look at this self-similar set, and we look at the partition dn, then the number, then <coughs> because we have no exact overlaps, the nth approximation has lambda to the n elements. But how, many, but how many intervals are occupied? Well, we have much less than that. We have um, n times magnitude of lambda. I guess this should be log lambda. And mag log lambda minus epsilon. And so just by pigeonhole principle, what you conclude is that you have many intervals that have exponentially many. Many of these intervals have exponentially many points in them. I don't want to say what many means, but many of the intervals in dn are such that i intersected with the nth approximation is exponential, is 2 to the epsilon prime n for some epsilon prime. OK, but now let's look at x of n plus m, where m is going to be some big multiple. Maybe m is 100 n. Some big multiple. Well, if you look at, you can, we have this, this co-cycle relation. So x of n plus m is x of n plus r to the n x of m. And I can decompose the nth approximation according to which intervals I'm in. So it's the union over i and dn of xn intersected with i plus rn xm. Now, OK, let me quickly, I'll try to get to the punchline. It will be too fast to understand, but uh, I'll try to get to the punchline. So the punchline is that if you look at n, m plus n of x m plus n, on the one hand, this is like 2 to the, well, n log lambda, uh, well, 2 to the n dim x plus little o of 1. On the other hand, we have this representation. This representation as a union tells us that, <coughs> well, so now I'm going to really be very imprecise, but it's more or less, it's bounded by, it's more or less like the sum over the level n piadic intervals of n, n plus n of x n intersected with i plus r n x m. Now, this is an interval of length p to the minus n. Uh, I'm so, uh, sorry. Uh, the point is that if you ignore the first term, if you just take one scaled copy of x m, already, when you look at it at m scales smaller, it's scaled by r to the n. If you look at m, sc m scales smaller, n of m plus n of r n x m is going to be also 2 to the m dim x plus little o of 1. 
And so, and the number of terms is like n n of x n. So, because when this is empty, you don't actually care about it. And so, when if you just divide out, you see that this sum, you see that many of these terms in this sum actually have to be on the same order, two to the m dim x plus little o of one. And what that tells you is, OK, and again, I'm not going to tell you what many means here. <clears throat> but now we had, on the one hand, we had many of those intervals that had exponentially many points in them. And on the other hand, we have, we have many intervals that um, satisfy this. And so hopefully, you can choose i such that when you look at at scale n plus n at x n intersected with i plus x m scaled by r n, you get 2 to the m dim x plus little o of 1, which is the same as n n plus m of r to the n x m. So in other words, the covering number of this sum is not much bigger than the covering number just of this term. And so now the question is, can this, can this be? And so this should be true. And this guy has exponentially many points. So the question is, is, it, is such a relationship possible when <clears throat> these exponentially many points are not all very close to each other? And the answer is that this is impossible. Impossible unless the covering number at scale n plus m of just of the thing that you're adding, xn intersected with i, is very small. And when this is very small, what it tells you is that there are many points in the set that are extremely close together. And that's where this super exponential concentration comes from. So I suspect that this was a little bit hard to follow. Um, but it's really, it's really very elementary. It just comes out of this. It just comes out of this, um, this very simple relationship when you look at when you analyze what it says at a small scale. And then the hard thing is to understand this deduction, and that fits. As I said, that fits into additive combinatorics. Um, okay, I'll give another talk about that, that sometime, maybe, but not today. So thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>